الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on his last prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. My brothers and sisters, it is my pleasure to be with you here in Perlis once again after a number of years. <clears throat> and I've been tasked with clarifying for you the, the nullifiers of Tawheed. The previous speakers spoke on Tawheed itself, its relevance to life and, and the various elements of Tawheed which are important for us to grasp. So my task is to tell you what Tawheed isn't. You heard already what Tawheed is. My task is basically to let you know what Tawheed is not. If we say, as others have said, that Tawheed is about maintaining Allah's unique unity in all aspects of our lives. In other words, it is expressed in the declaration of faith the shahadatan, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it is not just a word of faith, but a guide to life in this world that Allah has created us. Its opposite, which is the essence of the nullifiers of Tawheed is shirk. The reality is that Islam alone actually teaches and calls people to the worship of belief in one God. There are other religions that we also call monotheistic religions, Christianity and Judaism. But when you look into the essence of their teachings, you find that it is riddled with shirk. Islam is the only religion which teaches the belief in one God. However, that one God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the 12th chapter, verse 106, told us, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ Mushrikun. The majority of those who claim to believe in Allah, to believe in one God, actually commit shirk. And shirk naturally is the one unforgivable sin. In Allah Yaghfiru an yushraka bihi wa yaghfiru ma'duna dhalika liman yasha. Indeed, Allah doesn't forgive anyone who gives him partners, but he forgives what is less than that for whomsoever he wishes. The essence of giving partners to Allah, shirk, is intermediation. Because people hold the belief in God, 
while seeking what they should be seeking from God through intermediaries. Some people explain it to people, to the masses, that you are covered in sin. How can you seek to approach the Almighty God, Allah, in your state of corruption? You need somebody who is pure, free from sin, to carry whatever request you have to Allah <clears throat> on your behalf. This is one of the rationales that are used. If you want to meet with or get the help of the Prime Minister of Malaysia, you can't go to him directly. You have to go through intermediaries, your local government officials who then go through national government officials who might get to the president and your request may be heard. So they say in the same way, how can you expect to get to Allah in your state? So intermediation, putting somebody, someone, something between ourselves and Allah is the way to get Allah's help according to those who are not muwahidun who have not established tawheed as a life principle but who only give lip service to tawheed the reality is that when we supplicate, when we call on others besides Allah <clears throat> for help, we are destroying the foundation of our faith, which Allah gave us in Surah Al-Fatiha, the first chapter of the Quran, when he told us, taught us, to say, Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. You alone do we worship, and from you alone do we seek help. That is the foundation. That's what we're saying in our prayers on a daily basis, throughout the year, throughout our lives. So when we turn to others, and the greatest of the others that people often turn to is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They call to him in worship. They send their prayers to Allah through Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But there are so many statements from the Prophet Sallallahu forbidding this, calling on him. So many verses in the Quran prohibiting this. So intermediation, shirk to intermediation is something we should be clear on as a nullifier of Tawheed. It cancels the validity of Tawheed. Also, after Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the next most popular nullifier are the saints. Muslims have saints called awliya. Though Prophet Muhammad didn't teach us anything about saints. 
practices from Christianity. The Catholics have saints for everything. If you've lost something, there's a saint that you pray to. If you're going on a journey, there's a saint that you pray to, to, to protect you. And so on and so forth. A saint for everything. Muslims have awliya. And that is Muslims who are caught up in Sufi practices, teachings, and thought. Among the leading saints is Ibn Arabi, a 12th century Sufi who was known as a Sheikh Al Akbar by his followers till today. A Sheikh Al Akbar, the biggest, greatest Sheikh. He called himself Khatimul Awliya, as we have Khatimul Nabiyyin. Prophet Muhammad was the seal of the prophethood. He said, I'm the seal of the sainthood. And actually, according to his thought regarding saints, they are actually on a higher level than the prophets. A'udhu Billah. He called to Wahdatul Wujud, the unity of existence. So here comes his Tawheed. So what does his Tawheed say? It says that Allah is everything and everything is Allah. Allah is the only existence. It appears to us that we are different people, different beings and things in this world, but actually we are all a part of Allah. And Harun Yahya, I don't know some of you remember him, maybe he sort of fell out of favor and was arrested by the government for molesting young women, etc. He's in jail, got life sentence. His books became very popular at one point. They were everywhere. He dealt with some issues concerning evolution and you know that impressed people. Brought a lot of imagery and pictures and things like this. He had a lot of people working for him, preparing his literature. And his books could be found in virtually every school, Muslim school across the planet. I remember when I first opened up his book and I read it, the introduction, he has an introduction before the actual introduction of the particular book which he has written or compiled or was compiled for him. And in that I could hear him voicing the words of Ibn Arabi. He was saying the same thing. He was arguing for the oneness of existence. Wahdatul Wujud. And he referred to Sheikh Akbar as Sheikh Al Akbar. He didn't mention his name, but he used that title. So from the time I first read it, I immediately tried to inform as many people as I could in lectures, in, on the internet, etc., warning them against Harun Yahya. So Ibn Arabi 
and many others who came after him invited people to worship Allah through themselves. Using that same logic I explained to you about trying to get to the top. You need to go through intermediaries who are going to facilitate for you that connection. Another nullifier is that of magic and fortune telling. Popular here in Malaysia, known as Bomo, right? And this, of course, the Prophet ﷺ directly forbade. He said, whoever goes to a fortune teller and believes in him has disbelieved. Has disbelieved in what I brought in some narrations. This is not a part of Islam at all. So we need a campaign from one end of Malaysia to the other, banning the BOMO. Because if we don't do it, it will carry on to the next generation. Furthermore, among the acts which are considered nullifiers of Tawheed is supporting the disbelievers against the believers. Supporting the disbelievers against the believers. We can see that happening to some degree in Palestine today. We're suffering from it right now. And Allah told us, وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُمْ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ Whoever makes them their closest friends is one among them. So, we have to as Muslims speak out to our fellow Muslims in other parts of the world where the systems that they live under are supporting Israel on, against our Muslim brothers and sisters in Palestine, protectors of the third of the holy mosques, Masjid al-Aqsa. Another principle of nullification is refusing to declare a disbeliever a disbeliever. I remember hearing people say at different points in time that Christians are believers. You know, they believe in God. When they say they believe in one God, well, they're believers. We don't need to call them kafirs. That's so harsh, you know. It's rough. It's dealing with them in a very rough and harsh way. And Allah told us that, you know, we should call in a nice way, nicest way. When we speak to non-Muslims, etc., invite them to Islam. Wisely and in good logical speech. However, the reality 
is that the Prophet is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ ثَالِثُ ثَلَاثَ Those who say that Allah is the third of three, and this is the basic belief in Christianity, that's their tawheed. Allah declares them to be disbelievers. So when we stand up and we say, no, the Christians are believers. We're going directly against the Quran. Another more sensitive topic in terms of disbelievers and disbelief is the Prophet Sallallahu father and his mother. In Mecca, there was a house not too far from the Haram, which people said was the house of Abdullah, the father of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And people would go there and make two rakah in there for barakah. A few years back, the government in Saudi Arabia finally got around to breaking it down. When they destroyed it, put up something in its place. The world, the Muslim world that had been used to coming and making two rakah in the house of the father of the Prophet they screamed. These Saudi Wahhabis destroying our artifacts, holy artifacts. A'udhu Billah. However, on one occasion, it is authentically reported that a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and asked him, where's my father? His father's dead. Where is my father? And the Prophet ﷺ said, your father is in hell. The man, stunned, turned away, tears in his eyes, started to walk away. And the Prophet ﷺ called out to him, wait, wait, wait. He said, he's with my father. Hmm, what does that mean? The Prophet's father is in hell. I know if you say that to certain Muslims, they may, they may kill you. You know? They'll be so upset. They might actually kill you as an enemy of Islam, degrading the father of the Prophet. So, when you mention that the Prophet had asked permission of Allah to pray for his own mother. Who had passed. Allah did not give him permission. So what does that mean? What does that mean? The Prophet ﷺ was not given permission to pray for his mother. This is because she died a disbeliever. So for you to say that both the Prophet Sallallahu father and mother were disbelievers, Subhanallah, people would kill you, tear you apart, you evil Wahhabi. See these Wahhabis? They hate the mother and father of the Prophet
Moving on to other nullifiers of Tawheed. Included are preferring other sources of guidance over Islam's sources. Meaning, instead of following what the Prophet ﷺ said, what Allah Taala said, we choose other ways. And in such cases, the Prophet ﷺ had said very clearly, Inna asdaq al-hadithi kitabullah. The most truthful form of speech is the book of Allah. Wa khayr hadi hadi Muhammadin. And the best source of guidance was the guidance brought by Muhammad This was popular Juma khutbah begins with that. And it clearly promotes the Quran and the Sunnah as the primary sources of guidance for Muslims. The best form of speech, the best source of guidance. It doesn't mean that we can't take from others, other systems, etc. That human beings may not come up with good ideas which are beneficial to society, we can utilize them. No, of course, we can. However, when we find a challenge, what we have found contradicts or goes against the Quran or the Sunnah, what are we supposed to do? Put it aside. And we have sufficient verses in the Quran, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ or whoever doesn't rule by what Allah has revealed is misguided. All the way to disbeliever. Different levels of misguidance. Another area of nullification of Tawheed is that of ridiculing parts of Islam. For example, the inheritance, male, female, two to one. Muslims under the influence of Western civilization's thought and dividing things down the middle 50-50. They ridicule, look, Islam giving two portions to men and one portion to women and what's this? Where Muslims participate in this, ridicule Islam on that basis, they're nullifying their Tawheed. Because Tawheed is not just related to Salah. Also, five times daily prayer. I've met non-Muslims who say, you know, you guys, you pray like robots. Robots, five times daily, you're up there making your prayer. Instead, we pray when it comes into our hearts. When we feel that need to reach out to God. We call on God at that time. Whereas you guys are just robots. That's what they say. I say, well, okay, that sounds like a nice thought. But if you don't feel like reaching out to God today, you don't pray today. And if tomorrow you also don't, you don't pray tomorrow. 
If all week you don't, you don't pray all week. If all month you don't, you don't pray all month. If a year goes by and you didn't, then you didn't pray for a year. So, what happened to your connection with God? Also, among the nullifiers is disregarding Islam's teachings, abandoning salah and fasting, abandoning salah and fasting, becoming a Friday Muslim. You go to the masjid on Friday. Or you're a Ramadan Muslim. Ramadan, you're up and praying and doing all this. Once Ramadan is over, back to normal. So nullification of Tawheed actually is nullification of Islam. Since the foundation of Islam is Tawheed, there is no real Islam without Tawheed. What we are left with is cultural Islam. And this, this is what so much of the Muslim world today is caught up in, the struggle between Cultural Islam, this is what our foreparents did. This is what great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, everybody was doing this. So, you, what you're bringing is something new. We prefer to follow the way of our foreparents. So Islam, Tawheed, is not a life-changing, life-guiding principle. It's just cultural practices. But everybody in my province, everybody in my country, my city do, I do the same. We need to be careful of them. We need to advise those around us who are engaged in them. And we need to ensure that our families are free from them. But since nullification of Tawheed is nullification of Islam, It is worth mentioning in closing that we have to be careful about now labeling people as disbelievers, what is known as takfir. We have to be careful about it because on one hand, Pointing out what is correct and incorrect is a responsibility where we have some knowledge. But at the other hand, labeling people disbelievers is a great and grave sin. The Prophet ﷺ had said, إِذَا كَفَّرَ الرَّجُلُ أَخَاهُ فَقَدْ بَاءَ بِهَا أَحَدُهُمَا If someone declares his brother or sister to be a disbeliever, a kafir, it will apply to one of them. It will apply to one of them. Meaning, it will go back on that individual 
if the person they have declared to be a disbeliever isn't really a disbeliever. So, especially for those of us that are seeking knowledge, and we're in the beginning of that search, it's best to stay away from this. Where you end up when you indulge in it is ISIS. ISIS is a classical example of declaring Muslims non-Muslims. Declaring and making the blood of Muslims halal. So, beware. We have general rules, which are what I outlined before. The different examples of principles which denigrate Tawheed which damage and lower Tawheed. These are general rules. But then, on the other hand, we have to have and be aware of specific cases. Those specific cases, if we don't have in-depth knowledge, then we are likely to incorrectly label Muslims as non-Muslims. Takfir. There's a hadith in Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari in which the Prophet ﷺ had talked about a man in the past. A man who told, gathered his family together and told them, when I die, and he must have been close to death, Burn my body, crush my bones, and scatter them in the sea. Burn my body, crush my bones, and scatter what comes from it into the sea. For by Allah, if Allah grabs hold of me, he will punish me more than anyone else in this world. They did what he asked. And after they did it, Allah reconstituted him, resurrected him, and asked him, why did he do that? Why did he tell his people to do that? And he answered, my fear of you My fear of you, O oh Allah. And Allah forgave him. This is a man who doubted about Allah's power. Because he's thinking that Allah couldn't reconstitute him. If his remains were scattered in the sea, khalas. There's no judgment for him. And that belief is kufr. But in spite of the fact that in what he said was actually kufr, because it was out of his fear of Allah, his ignorance is what led him to do that, Allah put him in paradise. So that's why we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful in the matter of takfir. It is so serious and mistakes in it so grave that those of you that are seeking knowledge should refrain from indulging in it. In the enthusiasm of many who come to realize what is correct Islam, 
and what is extreme and what is misguided, cultural, etc., etc. Many go overboard. And then they start cutting people off the manhaj. Off the manhaj.com. Lists are there. Sheikh so and so, Sheikh so and so, not Sheikh. These aren't Sheikhs. They're misguided. They're not true Salafis. Though they, these individuals have been calling to the Quran and Sunnah, the Salafi understanding, Quran and Sunnah, for years. Some of them before these individuals are born. But here they are now declaring these people misguided and misguiders. So the advice is that students who are seeking knowledge today should refrain from indulging in tech fear and focus instead on beneficial knowledge to rectify their own affairs. This is what I wanted to share with you this afternoon regarding the nullifiers of Tawheed. Tawheed being a life-changing principle and its opposite, a misguiding principle. So as we know what Tawheed is, we do need to know what Tawheed isn't. Barakallah feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.